Hey there, my name is Heather. I'm the executive director here at Believers Church. And who are you, fella? Hey there. <laughs> I am Jamie. I am one of the pastors uh, here at Believers. Yes. All right. Well, we are in episode three of a chat around women in ministry. And the, if you haven't listened to the other two, I would really recommend you stop this video stop. right now and go listen to that. Um, the other two, we were able to kind of give some background in the first episode, as well as look at some of the scriptures that kind of seem to talk against women being in leadership. And then in the second episode, we really kind of dug into passages that look like it really makes a case for women being a part of high levels of leadership within the church. And so now in this episode, we're really going to talk about what that looks like here yeah. at Believers. And um, part of that you'll hear in the other episodes is that our elder team, along with Jamie, has really been doing a deep dive into this uh, study through scripture and through other books that they've been going through and scholar, uh, scholar information. So um, yeah, we're just going to talk about what conclusions they have come to. Yeah. So Jamie, you want to give us a little background and then yep. get us up to speed on what's happening yep. now. So, um, you know, just as a kind of a summation of yep. the conversation that we've had up to this point, um, you know, on the, on the side of keeping women out of ministry, um, you have, you know, four, maybe five passages, um, that are, I think everyone would acknowledge at the bare minimum are complex. Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots around them that we don't quite understand. Um, and they're not terribly clear on some of what it addresses. Like we mm -hmm. just don't, we don't really know exactly what, what they're getting at. Uh, we could just kind of draw some larger principles out of them. And on the other side of this, you have like just this overwhelming amount of passages that speak very specifically about actual women who were serving and leading in the church. And so uh, this quote by Leon Morris, he's an Australian New Testament scholar, uh, and he says of women in ministry, he says, and I quote, if God endows women with spiritual gifts, which he does, and thereby calls them to exercise their gifts for the common good, which he does, the church must recognize God's gifts and calling, must make appropriate spheres of service available to women, and should ordain, that is commission, and authorize them to exercise their God-given ministry at best in team situations. Our Christian doctrines of creation and redemption tell us that God wants his gifted people to be fulfilled, not frustrated, mm -hmm. and his church to be enriched by their service. Such a good word. It's such a great quote. <laughs> so what does that mean for believers moving forward? So um, a couple of things. Um, for one, it means that people with spiritual gifts have the freedom to exercise their spiritual gifts. Um, and so whether you're, you know, teaching, um, or leading in, in believers kids or for real student ministry or, you know, at the table or next gen ministry or with adults or in a small group context, uh, women with gifts of leadership and teaching are, encouraged to exercise their spiritual gifts. Um, so that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been, so that's been happening right. at Believers. So that's really almost, you know, virtually no change. Right. Well, and in some ways, like we've talked about this a little bit, a lot of what you're going to be laying out for us is already happening in practice. Mm -hmm. It just, there's a few like, policy kind of things yeah. that are changing. Yep. But this isn't like a huge leap for us. Correct. In a lot of practical ways. Yeah, that's correct. It's it's not. I mean like from a from a day to day right now, there's not a whole lot that's gonna be different than what it is today. Mm -hmm. Um there are some uh steps that we're taking to be more uh inclusive yep. um in our process of of um who's leading at what levels mm -hmm. in our church. So, you know, like our elders, um, 
allowing both men and women to serve mm-hmm. in that capacity and um, the ordination of both men and women for ministry, which, you know, is a, is a, it's not like an ordination thing is, is, it sounds like a really big deal. I mean, it, it's, it's important, but it's happened like three times since I've been right. the pastor here. So it's not like it's an everyday occurrence yeah. kind of thing either. So uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, so basically, um, yeah, elders, uh, there will be a there will be a process. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. We're we're going to work on a process of being able to onboard um, uh, women into to those roles and capacities, um, and it's going to take. We're going to lay a good foundation so that um, it's going to take a little bit of time mm-hmm. to do that. But that's the direction that we're headed. Yeah. So um, let's talk about elders first, and then we'll talk about women as pastors. Yeah. Um, So can you tell us just what's the current state of our elder team? How does someone come onto that team? What's the training that they go through? Because it's it is a lengthy process that we put people through. It is, and you know, some people will say, you know, like, well, who are they? And you know, they're they're not. And what do they do? And what do they do? (laughs) Um, And they're you know they're not always like you know, the, the most visible, but then again, you know, like, do you know everyone who's leading in next gen or whatever? Right. I mean, you don't, so it's, it shouldn't be that shocking really. There's even a lot of our staff that are kind of behind the scenes type people that yeah, the people, people don't could know. walk through and buy exactly. and not even realize it. Unless they're, um, unless they're trying to go into our kids space right. without a pass <laughs> and then they get tackled uh-huh. right there on the spot. Absolutely. Yeah. As we they, support it. As they should. <laughs> so that actually happened. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so the elder process right now, um, first of all, what do, who are, what do they do? Yeah. I guess we'll kind of start with that, and then I'll talk about how they, they uh, come on. So um, elders at Believers... Um, Kind of have a dual function, really. the The first would be uh, they provide um, oversight. I mean, the word elder is overseer, so they they oversee what's happening ministry wise. So the staff run day to day ministry because we're here every single day. So like that's what the the staff runs ministry. The elders give oversight to that. So uh, part of that means. They determine um, kind of the through our our doctrines and through our policies and through our practices, they they define the boundaries of ministry that the staff operates within. So um, like this issue is an issue that the elders have looked at, and that's part of establishing what that boundary of ministry is going to look like. Yep. Um, so that's that's mainly what they do. So, you know, there's reviewing of financial records. Mm -hmm. There's, um, you know, reviewing of, uh, you know, what staff are doing. I keep them updated as to, you know, the Mm day-to-day stuff of what's happening around the ministry. And they, um, you know, so they're apprised of that. So they give some oversight to that. The other other thing that they do. On that, though, I was going to say, like, I think that's important is that, to understand that there, it's an oversight type thing. Right. So they're they really do support us as a staff and Correct. and lay that groundwork. But it's not like in some church contexts where they're making the decisions for what Correct. is happening. Our staff is really doing a lot of that. Yeah, and you. So it gets a little <laughs> you know layered and complicated. But you know there are some church settings. Uh, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm very good friends with a with a guy whose church, uh, their staff is their elders. Mm. So that's how they view the elders. It's the leaders of the church, the overseers of ministry. That is by definition the staff, and so um, his staff are his elders. I could I I could actually agree with that. I think there's there's something to be said for that. But I think having the layer of elders who are part of the membership of believers who are invited in to be part of defining those boundaries and giving oversight to me mm-hmm. uh, and to the the remaining staff, I think is helpful and healthy. Mm-hmm. So um, they, that's the other part that the elders do. They they oversee me. You. <laughs> yeah. 
So I'm I'm a I'm a I'm one of the elders, and I'm accountable to the elders. So um, yeah, so so that's so they're kind of my if you want to think of it in these these terms, they're almost like my executive board. So I meet with them twice a month and talk about what's happening in my world and in ministry as far as uh, you know how I'm leading and doing. I will solicit their input for uh, if I'm struggling with questions uh, or if we as a staff are struggling with something or the directional team mm -hmm. is wrestling through a matter. Um, I will solicit their input because they, they have spiritual wisdom and maturity. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, wisdom in multiple uh, of counselors, so I seek their input. So that's the other part of what they do. So yeah. kind of general oversight and accountability um, for me and kind of my my executive team that kind of gives me mm -hmm. a, a sounding board. Um, so the process that they go through is a is a pretty lengthy process, and if you don't like process, you're not going to like the next five minutes. So uh, but basically, it's this. We identify people who are already leading at Believers because we, you don't go through a process and become an elder. Um, it's our highest echelon of leadership. So yeah. you wouldn't like go from You're not going to go from not, gonna go serving, from not to, serving to th yeah. this. So it's someone who's already overseeing people mm -hmm. in ministry. So they're demonstrating the ability to lead. They're demonstrating spiritual maturity. Um they're demonstrating investment in the ministry of believers. Um, so before anyone's even invited onto the team, um, I mean, we look at where do they serve? How are they serving? Are they, are they faithful? Are they right. consistent? Uh, are they giving? Because mm -hmm. we want people who are leading here to be invested here. Right. That just makes sense. So are they giving here? Um, and... Uh, if they meet the you know the basic criteria of what we would say an elder ought to be doing anyway, um, we invite them into a, an elder training process, and the process lasts about six months, and um, it's a uh, we go through a study of a book um, on leaders and elders in the local church and what that looks like and what their role is and uh, how to be people of prayer and how to be, um, you know, what spiritual care looks like and all those kinds of things. And, um, and then we, in that process, put them on a track to be um, in, interrogated, I guess is the yeah. right word, interviewed. And um, we interview them and their spouse because when you serve in that role, it's a significant time commitment. And um, both the husband and the wife, both of the couple, need to be on board with that. Yeah. And uh, some of the things that they end up dealing with in a term of service can be very heavy and... And taxing at home. Yes. So uh, we want to make sure that everyone in the home is aware. He's on board. Yeah, and on board with <laughs> that. And so there's an interview process that goes on uh, for both him. Uh, currently, that's the way it is yeah. for both him and her. But, you know, moving forward... Uh, it would be, you know, for both yep. of the couple. Um, and uh, then there's, a, uh, we get references. So uh, the Bible says that an elder should be a person who has a good reputation, not just in the church, but also yep. in the community. So we get a reference uh, from an employer. We get a reference from uh, people outside of the church. And we also do references from people inside of mm -hmm. the church, uh, people who serve with them so that we have a pretty good idea of who this person is, both in church and outside of church. And, um, and at the end of the six-month process, some people are invited to come onto the team. Some, there's uh, some work maybe that needs to be done before they would be allowed to serve on the team. Maybe they're not quite there yet. Um, they also have a doctrinal thing that they need to kind of mm -hmm. talk about what they believe and why they believe it. Um, and then others, you know, just might, they might be great people who aren't really cut out to, to yeah. serve in elders. And they might even say that as they go right. through the process. Right, I was going to say, yeah. we've even had some mm -hmm. guys that have gone through it before and been like, this is great. I've learned so much. I it's appreciate <laughs> this opportunity. <laughs> right. I'm out. Like, yep. I don't want to do yep. this. That's right. So, yeah. 
So, um, so that's kind of the process that we take people through. And like I said, it's, it takes about six months to do. And so, um, what we're working on right now that what the current elders are working on is, um, you know, how do we, how are we going to make sure, ensure that this process, um, is inclusive of both men and women yeah. in, in roles of leadership here. So, And I think the big thing that's going to take a little time in this is that our elder board um, serves on rotation. Yeah. And so while we might bring some women on fairly soon, um, the way that we rotate people on and off, it might be a little bit of time before we see like a real balanced Correct. Um, male and female elder board. Yes. And... Um, just like from a practical matter, um, you know, one of the, I, I know of pastors who would hold to the view that that I do on women in ministry who do not have women serving as elders because um, it creates um, a dilemma for both, like if uh, if they go on an elder retreat, um, you know, with men and women, well, that, that can be awkward if there's only, you one know, woman. if there's only one woman or whatever. So, uh, so some just av to avoid that complexity altogether, they just don't have women in that role. Uh, I would rather deal with the complexity of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, so rather than just say, nope, we're not going to even deal with it. Let's just figure out a way to make yeah. it work. So uh, our idea is that we would onboard um, two women at a time mm -hmm. so that there's always at least two women yep. that would serve on that team. And that way it removes that as being a, a real obstacle. Yeah. That's great. So now um, let's talk about a little bit about the potential ordination process for mm -hmm. women that are currently on staff to yeah. become pastors or to even like hire a mm -hmm. female pastor. What does that look like? Yeah. So currently what that has looked like has been, um, you know, so on our staff, um, both Doug and Sam have been ordained by Believers Church and both of them uh were applying for ministry positions here. Both of them had theological training educationally. Um, and so they came in theologically trained and prepared for an area of ministry. They just weren't, you know, hadn't been ordained, you know, mm -hmm. officially through that process yet. So we had them uh, draft a, a doctrinal position paper, basically, that says, you know, here's what I believe. We've invited elders and pastors to to kind of grill them and make and even sh outside elders and, and pastors. even outside it's elders not, and pastors yep. to participate in that process of interviewing them around their beliefs mm -hmm. to make sure that they're solid on their biblical understanding, and then that uh, ordination council would make a recommendation to ordain or not to ordain. Uh, but it's the local church that does the ordination, mm -hmm. not that council. So yep. believers has the authority to ordain somebody. Um, like practically speaking, like the ordination allows someone, you know, to, to if you're going to marry someone, for instance, yep. got to be ordained. I mean, legally, that's just a requirement of the state. Um, unless you're a judge or something. I don't know how that works. But <laughs> you, know, you can you, get that online. You can buy an ordination <laughs> certificate online for $25. But... Um, that does not that that's a disservice to anyone who's who's <laughs> ordained and gone through a legitimate process. Um, so, um, so what we're we're going to do moving forward is you know like we're in this interesting place where we have some women on staff um, who are serving and overseeing areas of ministry, effectively serving as pastors, uh, who are not. Uh, they're directors of different things. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we would do is define a process for the ordination to happen. And um, so uh, I've started graduate school on a couple of different occasions through the years, never did finish. Um, but when I started it and applied, my ministry experience counted as X amount of hours of mm -hmm. theological training, you know, so I didn't have to redo everything. I, you know, you know, a semester's worth of classes is off because mm -hmm. I've already got X amount of ex experience. And so what we're going to do as elders is define, uh, what is that going to look like for anyone who's like maybe already here, you know, that's mm -hmm. already serving, 
how do they go through that process? Well, what's the, uh, without saying, okay, go get, go to seminary and get right. a seminary degree, uh, but what would be the equivalent of, based on the ministry experience that that person has, what would be the kind of the the requirements? And there are going to be some educational sure. requirements. I think it's important. There should be. There should be. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, we're going to establish what those baseline uh, educational requirements are going to be combined with ministry experience that would allow a person who is seeking ordination to go through that process and be, we'd be able to say, yes, you meet the criteria yeah. to be invited into this process. Um, so that's that's one thing. And then the other thing is uh, basically, uh, it's well, it's the same thing, but it would apply to people outside of the church too. Mm-hmm. So it's not just inside, but also someone from outside. If we're hiring someone or onboarding someone into ministry uh, who's coming from a maybe non-traditional background, non-traditional meaning not coming right out of seminary and applying for a Mm -hmm. ministry position, but applying for a ministry position that doesn't have, you know, like Sam and Doug got here, they weren't ordained, but they were coming Mm -hmm. in for this position. What is that process going to be that someone needs to go through in order to be ordained in ministry here? And just define what that looks like, and, and it would be the same for both men and for women. Yep. So. Yeah, and I know even with some of our conversations with women on staff, there are some that are really excited about that opportunity and will probably jump right into that and want to do whatever that track is. And then there are others that might not do that yeah. right away or at all. And right. so there is this component even to step into a pastoral role <clears throat> that we would all say like, there is a calling to yes, that. Like sure. there is a, the Holy Spirit has to be like moving you in that direction yep. and and calling you into that space in ministry. There's yep. a lot of other, uh, there's a lot of weight to that role. There and is. to just like step into that for a title is right. not what we want to have happen. Correct. That's not why we're doing this. Right. Um, so I think that's just really important to, yeah. to discuss. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's... <clears throat> You know, in the military, you know, there's certain roles that have been, you know, gender, mm-hmm. whatever. And there's been, you know, some discussion about like, well, if this is the requirement to do this role, um, you know, should it be different for men and women? Now, the military has made the decision that they have different, you know, physical standards mm-hmm. or whatever for both men and women in same roles. What we're basically saying here is we're not going to do that. Right. It's going to be the same requirement for both men and women. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah. Anything else you want to share about this? Um, yeah, I mean, just to say that actually, I mean, for me, you know, like for for some, I get it. You know, this is a change, and they don't like change, and maybe even would disagree. But from from my perspective, uh, this is something that I'm I'm excited about. Mm-hmm. It's um, I think it's uh, probably long overdue, and. Um, you know, for anyone who has felt less than, hmm. not because we've ever communicated that, but just because, um, you know, certain roles or whatever that are not available to to you because you're a woman and, you know, there's men elders and, you know, you have great leadership gifts and uh, you feel like you have not been able to be, you know, as engaged or involved in ministry here, Um you know, I'm excited to be able to say, well, you know, let's explore it. Let's yeah, mm-hmm. step into those roles. Don't don't let that keep you out. And so to me, that's really pretty exciting. And um, yeah, I think, um, you know, taking taking these steps that we're taking is is very positive for believers. I think it, it will uh, help us to engage our community even better. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be a better reflection of of God's kingdom values. And so, yeah, I mean, all in all, I'm, I'm excited about where we're headed and, um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I'm open to, to fielding questions from folks Mm -hmm. as, as well. And, um, you know, as I stated at the beginning, you know, I I recognize that not everyone is going to necessarily agree, but I hope that we can all agree that we love Jesus and are going to follow him together and, um, you know, if we disagree on this, we can still agree that we love Jesus and want to see as many people in our community as possible end up in heaven one day because they have a relationship yes. with Jesus. It makes 
them better following Jesus does, makes them better at life. It'll mm -hmm. impact their families. Like it's just, there's so much good that comes from it. And that happens when we all agree to make the main thing the main thing. And that is uh, Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. So let's be about making Jesus number one, one person at a time, instead of making my right. uh, gender or my opinion yes. number one. 100%. Yeah. All right. Well, if you have any questions or want to continue this conversation um, with either of us, you can easily go to the believerschurch.org website and click on the contact us uh, button, and that will give you a space to write out your questions or your thoughts on this, and, and it will get routed to us. So we thank you for watching and investing your time in learning more about um, how Believers is handling this conversation.